All right, welcome back uh, to those of you in the room and those of you online. Um, hope you enjoyed that first panel with Scott and Caroline. Uh, we're now going to shift gears away from tax controversy and to a more technical presentation around international tax. Because, again, the, the – sorry? Equally as fun. Definitely get to go on better trips. I mean, <laughs> Vegas is nice, but not nearly as – Nice as some of the trips, Joan, I'm sure you've been on. Um, and again, what we want to do with this entire series is give our participants a, a window, allow each of us to be a fly on the wall of a, you know, a particular conversation and a practice area. And I, I can't think of a better pair than Joan and Heather to, to take us through this next uh, conversation around the fundamentals of U.S. outbound taxation. But before I introduce them, let me just congratulate both of them for their different uh, contributions they made over the past two years to the ta tax section. Joan was the chair when we went into the pandemic, and Joan had the unenviable job of trying to pivot almost immediately from uh, two years ago now, uh, the idea of a, a live meeting in May going to a fully virtual meeting in May. And she did it, and she did it with poise and with grace uh, and, and successfully, both in terms of the, the technical training as well as the finances of the section. So an absolutely magnificent achievement. Also, this series was Joan's idea to begin with. So uh, we have to credit Joan for that. Um, and now turning to Heather, Heather was is relatively new to the tax section, and Heather, Heather's energy and drive and new ideas and new insights into the way we can connect with one another as members and as professionals has been one of the crowning achievements of the tax section over the past two years. Uh, the, uh, again, this, this series owes a, a, a debt of gratitude and inspiration to the women's uh, tees that Heather and, and Joan have been, have been instrumental in, in driving. So with that, let me introduce Joan Arnold, and Joan is a senior partner at Troutman Pepper and a former chair, recovering chair of the tax section, as I noted. Uh, so she's been in leadership for a long time. And Heather Fincher is uh, on her own at, with Tax Law 20 and Fincher Law PLLC here in Washington, D.C. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to Joan and Heather to take us through the next hour. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, and thanks everybody for coming, both online and in person. Uh, we are going to have a very different presentation. Uh, we're introducing a number of different ways of learning about some of the, uh, the outbound tax issues and the careers that are available in outbound tax. Um, I'll give you a brief re recounting of my career. This is my 44th year of practice. Um, it changes every day, it's still interesting every day. I started out in international tax in the mid-70s. I had a backwards career. I started out in-house at Citi Citibank, which at that point in time, for those of you, you're all way too young, it used to be called First National City Bank of New York. I still have some of the China from the Vice President's lunchroom. Um, uh, and uh, my first job was uh, I had a room about a third of the size of this room, and it was full of cardboard boxes, floor to ceiling. And my job, uh, this was 1976, uh, you have to remember computers were not uh, a mainstay at that point in time, PCs didn't really exist. Um, and the bank had accrued cardboard boxes full of receipts for foreign taxes that had been paid on loans that they made. They were beautiful. They were consularized. They were ribbonized. They were sealed with wax. They were all not in English. Um, but unless we could figure out where, which receipts went with which loans, the IRS had said to us, you can't take a credit for all of the foreign taxes you paid. We got damn good at figuring out how to translate a Greek tax receipt uh, into the, the run of the computer of the uh, loan so we could figure out what it was. So to me, international tax has a very tassel feeling. Um, so I, was, I did that um, in 76 while I was in law school, um, and I stayed with Citibank for 10 years uh, doing just international work. Um, when, sometimes I did commercial bank, banking work, sometimes I did financial product work, 
Then um, I became a law school professor for eight years, uh, where I taught international tax and international business transactions and all kinds of other tax classes. My hallmark was that I rarely used a textbook. One year I taught the entire, se the t the entire semester out of um, the, the book Barbarians at the Gate, which was the RJR Nabisco takeover. Uh, it was a magnificently interesting course. The rest of my colleagues thought I was nuts um, because you don't get a lot of academic kudos for interesting teaching. Um, then I decided I was really meant to be a lawyer, practicing lawyer, so I went back out and in 95 I joined the firm of Pepper Hamilton in Philadelphia where I was known as the Immaculate Partner because I had never been an associate. Um, and uh, I've been at Pepper since 1995 and in 2020 we merged with Troutman Pepper so now I chair the tax and benefits practice of a 1,200 person law firm. Um, I like the international avenues because it just, it, there's, there's, a, there's a theater term. You have to be willing to have a willing suspension of disbelief. I'll accept almost anything. You wanna tell me that India taxes you if you have six toes? Fine, I'll believe, you know? Um, because anything is possible uh, and, and what I like is trying to harmonize them and make them work together. Now my life has changed considerably since 2017 um, and considerably since 2013. We can talk a little bit about what happened in those years. Um, but it's a marvelously interesting area. I do know that um, uh, in my firm, the, co the corporate department, which includes tax sometimes, is in contrast to what um, um, Scott and Carolyn were talking about, my department is sometimes known as the pre-litigation department <laughs> because we're doing all the planning and all the deals and they, that's what gives rise to the litigation. So we're the pre-litigation department. Um, uh, I love listening to what they do. I think it's incredibly interesting, but I like what I do. I, 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 I think money is very compelling. I think money is very compelling because it drives societal behavior. And if I can follow the money and follow the changes in, in societal behavior, I can figure out what's going on in the world. Um, and th my area of tax is following the money and doing that. So it's really interesting. And I'm gonna ask Heather to please introduce herself. Hello everyone, I'm Heather Fincher. It's wonderful to see you all and I hope to meet you as well. Lovely to be in person again. Um, and hello to everyone watching virtually. I came to tax law later in my career. This is a second career for me. I went back to law school in my 30s and started my career in big law here in Washington, D.C. in the National Office of Baker Hostetler. I had a great experience. And I'm now um, out. I have two companies. One with, uh, with tax, it's called Tax Law 20. And one is my law firm, Fincher Law. With Tax Law 20, I create approachable, engaging, short form videos to bring tax, which generally is <laughs> very complicated and not approachable, to anyone who wants to learn it. Anyone who's starting out in tax, um, but particularly for finance and accounting professionals and um, multinationals that are constantly interacting with tax and need some access to the language and concepts to more effectively collaborate. So that's been super fun, and I'm going to bring some of my, a couple of little video clips to your presentation today, some of my techniques. I am very, um, I think I learn very visually, and I think can be very helpful to, to introduce complicated concepts piece by piece, and there will be very um, colorful visual uh, parts of our presentation here with slides as well as video. And with Fincher Law, I'm developing an expertise in transfer pricing intercompany agreements with um, a Fortune 500 companies, and right now supporting um, a super great global tax team in, in that area, as well as other special, proje special projects. So we thought we'd bring you two completely different backgrounds today. <laughs> right, um. right. So with today's presentation, basically we're gonna, for anyone interested in US outbound, we're, we're kind of dipping a toe into some of the, the main um, architecture of what US outbound practitioners and, and companies and multinationals are, are dealing with. And then we'll wrap it up with highlighting several different career paths if you're interested in US outbound. Um, and the way we're doing that is fun. We're highlighting specific um, ABA members and their career paths to give you a taste just kind of a little more practically about um, career paths they have taken and then highlighting some of the insights that we gathered um, in conversation with them. And this is an unabashed um, advertisement to get active in the ABA. Uh, my career would not be where it is today mm -hmm. 
had I not been active in the ABA and a couple of other organizations. Um, mm -hmm. and so we are, we're sitting here today. Heather came down from Vermont. I came down from Philadelphia. We want you to come and be active with us. Um, we, we offer a great deal, and we think it'll help you a lot. Now, we started today. I said to Heather, because, and by the way, one of my skills is picking the right people to do the right job. Um, when I decided that we should have a women in tax forum in the American Bar Association tax section, um, I turned to Heather, and I said, can you do this? And she went off like the Energizer Bunny as she is, and, and she did it. So when, when I got a call um, and said, you know, can you come down and talk about this? I said, can I ask Heather? Um, and the answer was yes. I said, sure, then I'll come, because I know, I know that we can do this together, and it'll be fun. The one thing I asked you to do, though, that we didn't get done, we are going to be talking about FIDI, BEAT, GUILTY, FIDE. I said, can you put that into a rap song? <laughs> she, she tried, but we I, didn't get there. <laughs> oh, I got there. I just haven't shared it with you yet. Oh, okay. I'll do it afterwards, well, we so for anyone it. interested. Okay. <laughs> um, so what we're hoping to do is to give you a sense of what it's like to practice in the field. And for those of you who are going to have any exposure to it, um, the words that I just ran down my fingertips, they don't come across to you as, what, what language is this woman speaking? Um, so well, this is not a technical issue, a technical um, presentation, other than to say, here's the things you ought to have heard about. That's right. We'll get a little bit into it. So here's the structure. Part one of our, of our talk, we're going to, before 2017 tax reform. Part two, after 2017 tax reform, which, you know, first time in over 30 years, um, the, the system, the international system was, 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 trans, was really changed. And then part three, we're covering the, the career paths. So to begin, Oh, by the way, outbound. What does outbound mean? Outbound means a U.S., for today, means a U.S. corporation that is investing or, or acting outside the United States. Ooh, sorry. No, no. Sorry? No, I, 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 oh, I was going to say, no, that was perfect, Joan. No, I could, I could well have burned out some ear, ear, uh, ear tubes for the people on, on the uh, <laughs> feed. <laughs> okay. So a few terms that are, that are on your screen right now that we need to at least be introduced to in order to make sense of some of the main roles that we're covering. So we're talking about USP, a US parent. And like Joan explained, outbound is we're looking at how is USP taxed on all its income and activities that are happening around the world, the global income and activities. And a, some, a lot of our rules will be triggered when there's a CFC, a controlled foreign corporation involved. So basically when there's ownership, when a US shareholder, which owns 10% or more of a foreign corporation, when a CFC is owned more than 50% by US shareholders, then it quali then, I mean, there's so many technical rules, but this is real general high level we're talking about, um, then the foreign corporation um, will be considered a, a CFC, a controlled foreign corporation, and rules are triggered for USP. Second thing we need to remember, when USP, so, oh, so a fun way to represent foreign customers is stick figure wearing a hat. So that's what this is. So when USP is earning income directly from a foreign customer, it's receiving cash up here. And where does it pay tax? The IRS. So tax is being paid up here. When CFC is earning income from the foreign customer, CFC earns cash. CFC pays tax to the foreign tax authority. So when this scenario happens, when CFC is earning, earning income, USP is considered to have deemed to earn income indirectly through CFC. So the question in that case, let's take off USP. So USP earned income directly. USP is now earning income indirectly. CFC has paid foreign tax. The question is, because USP earned income indirectly through CFC, does USP have to pay tax in the US? If USP is required under US tax laws to pay tax in the US when CFC earns that income, that's considered USP having to pay tax on a current basis. Um, and so, so USP would pay tax on a current basis. However, if CFC earns this cash, the cash stays down here, assets, all of that staying down outside of the United States. If USP doesn't have to pay tax in the US under US tax laws until this cash is brought home to the US, that means U.S. tax is deferred from U.S. tax. So 
current taxation, deferred taxation, and then earning income directly and indirectly, CFCs. Those are all basic, very important terms. Before 2017 tax reform, CFC, oh, I don't want this yet. USP was able to defer ta US tax on some of the foreign income earned by CFC. To break it down, it's kind of fun to talk pictures. So if CFC has a factory and it's, and it's, earning, in it's, earn it's earning income with its employees, so its own, own business activities, this could be considered active income. And then if it owns patents, stocks, and bonds, CFC, uh, are, um, the income from here is royalties, dividend for, for USP, royalties, dividends, and interest, interest in this, sorry, down here, in, in, royalties, interest, those are the types of income. So this could be considered passive income. Before 2017, a set of rules called subpart F, that's a, a part of the code, taxed USP on income it earned indirectly through CFC on passive income generally. We're not going into all the exceptions where anyway, so Joan, stop me if I go to, okay, good, too technical. But corporations were able to plan and their, the rules were structured in such a way that only a small slice of income from CFC actually had to be included through subpart F in USP's US income to be taxed in the US. The rest of this income earned by CFC, USP could defer paying US tax until that income was brought home. So just to put it into context, in 2017, it was estimated that there was $3 trillion of foreign earnings in, in foreign subsidiaries of U.S. corporations that previously had not been subject to U.S. tax. Uh, so it's a big deal. Uh, it was a big concept. Can you talk a little bit more about the origins? Yeah. Uh, one of the that. things I like is I really like um, uh, to watch history as it's developed through the tax law. Um, and there's lots of good books that you can read, like Showdown at Gucci Gulch, which was all about the, um, it, it was the, the hallway where all the lobbyists stood in 1986 when they passed the, uh, the 1986 Tax Act with the Gucci referring to the loafers that all of the lobbyists wore. It was a great book. Anyway, I started practicing in the mid-70s, and Subpart F existed. It came into existence in 1962 uh, in, the, in the Kennedy era. Um, and I never could quite understand what the brouhaha was about it. Because as Heather pointed out, unless you put passive income offshore, it was pretty damn easy to arrange your affairs so that you didn't have to bring any of the income back and be subject to tax in the United States. That's how you build up $4 trillion. But we got this bill, we got this in 1962. There was some argument that Kennedy wanted everything offshore to be su subject to current tax, and this was a compromise. And then I got to have lunch with one of the key personnel in the Kennedy administration um, who was doing a favor to a friend of mine. This is like reaching out to people so you get to know other people. Um, doing a favor for a friend of mine who said, you know, this woman, this young woman, really wants to learn more about how this came about. Can you talk to her? And he said, yes, but it can't be for attribution. So I will not tell you his name as we are sitting here today. Um, and he said, tell me what you know about subpart F. I said, well, nobody pays any taxes by virtue of subpart F. But the annual reporting under subpart F is a royal pain in the neck. And he said, you got it. I said, what are you talking about? Now think about it. He said, think about it. It was 1962. Where were we politically in 1962? We were in the middle of a raging Cold War and a Cuban Missile Crisis. I said, OK, you have to help me. I'm floundering here. He said, we needed to know where the multinationals had their cash. He said, we needed a reporting regime. We needed to be able to figure out how to access it if we needed it. I said, so you put subpart F in the code? so that everybody had to file a 5471 on all of their foreign subsidiaries? He said it worked. Um, we didn't, there, there were no teeth to subpart F until 1986. In 1986, when Reagan's, when Reagan's um, uh, budget wasn't working and they needed to bring up more revenue, they radically changed subpart F and it was much harder to avoid subpart F inclusions after 86. Then in somewhere in the 90s, it went back the other way. And, and now you can generally avoid subpart F, except for the passive income basket. 
Um, but I, I personally think that if you like that kind of knowledge base, that's why I think international is just so fascinating. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Then 2017 tax reform. And I almost retired. <laughs> in 20, the, the, the change in 2017 was so radical that I thought, oh, and I decided I had to work for a while more. <laughs> so here we are. 2017 ended deferral. Now we all know what that is. Kept subpart F in, in, in place and added new international provisions that we're going to cover. Lowered the corporate, the, the top rate was 35%, lowered the corporate rate to 21%, and imposed a transition tax, which JCT estimated US corporations would pay what, 300 billion, I think it was? Well, the offshore income that had to be brought into income was 3 trillion. Right. So U.S. tax was paid was paid on so that over a, a certain money. time. Like, yes. I don't even know how you write checks for that big. It's like you know, how do you, how do, you do a funds flow when you have to pay that much kind of money? I don't know. So Eric's going to help us here with uh, um, a short three-minute video. I'm sharing from an introduction to guilty, which is the regime that ended ended um, deferral. Uh, so we can just shift gears a little bit and have the screen introduce us to guilty. It's another way to show you a whole nother career in tax. This is Heather's company. Can the sound come up anymore? Welcome to Tax Law 20. I'm Heather Fincher. Guilty is probably the most impactful change to international tax law in decades. Almost everyone in international business has heard about guilty, but for most, it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So I'm excited to share this video with you because together we can begin demystifying guilty. So to begin with, what's the big change? Why is guilty such a big deal? Before tax reform in 2017, U.S. corporations could defer paying tax in the United States on the lion's share of their foreign earnings. Guilty was Congress's program for ending that deferral. Based on this change under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, most U.S. corporations are now subject to a worldwide minimum tax under GILTI. GILTI is an acronym that stands for Global Intangible Low Taxed Income. And even the name is confusing because GILTI isn't a tax on intangibles. Let's break down what GILTI is and isn't using each letter of the acronym. G stands for global because guilty is a tax on U.S. shareholders everywhere. If foreign income is being earned anywhere in the world through a controlled foreign corporation by a U.S. shareholder and it's not taxed under subpart F, it's going to be subject to guilty because guilty is a global tax. The I stands for intangible. However, guilty is not directly tied to intangible income. Obviously, this is confusing for most people. Chris may have been aiming at intangible inflation, but LT is not a tax intangible income. LT tax based on a formula. You'll hear tax professionals talk about how guilty is formulaic because it's based on a formula. Guilty doesn't care about the origin of the income it taxes, so taxpayers with no intangible assets are still subject to guilty because guilty is not specifically a tax on intangible income. Let's combine the last three letters of the acronym. LTI stands for low taxed income. Guilty is designed to tax foreign income in low tax jurisdictions. But what's a low tax jurisdiction? Congress decided that income in foreign jurisdictions that used to sit offshore for years at a time in a state of deferred taxation should now be taxed every year at about half the U.S. corporate rate. So basically, Congress said if foreign income isn't taxed at a high enough rate, it's low tax income and subject to the guilty minimum tax in the U.S. So, with guilty, this portion of CFC's earnings is now taxed on a current basis to USP in the U.S. The rules are super complicated and they incorporate it's another acronym that you have to hear. QBI. Um, guilty income is all of the test is all of the income of your foreign subsidiary that was not subpart F income, to the extent it exceeds 10% of your your tangible assets. Guilty had its its groundings in the Obama administration, 
um, where he, that administration was really trying to say that um, the drug companies had put too much profit in Ireland, and it was all based on their IP, and that, uh, that uh, Microsoft had done the same thing. And they really wanted to tax the return on the intangible, in, on the intangible property that was shifted into Ireland. Um, they didn't get that in the Obama proposals. And when we got our 2017 Tax Act, um, they kind of picked up on that, which is where we get the name from. But it's a very different concept. To the extent the company is earning income on uh, what is deemed to be a reasonable return on its bricks and mortar, OK, we won't tax that income. So we look at a CFC. First slice is subpart F income. That's includable in the US shareholder's hand. The next slice is guilty. Guilty is the rest of the income to the extent it exceeds 10% of your intangible assets and your net interest expense. So if you're a bricks and mortar company and you've got a lot of money in your uh, facilities outside the United States, you may not have a lot of guilty pickup. On the other hand, if you're a services company or you're a virtual company, where, where a lot of my clients are these days in the, in the life sciences space, you don't own anything. You don't have any intangible assets. So in that case, 100% of your income will be guilty income and will be currently included in the US shareholder's hand. But going back, if you're a bricks and mortar company, if you're heavily capital dependent, um, not all of your income will be guilty. It's only to the extent it exceeds 10% of your tangible assets and your net interest expense. But, uh, but, but look at this. This is like, OK. We used to say, and clients don't understand this yet, um, they still come into the office and they say, I've got this great idea. I'm going to put all of my income in an in a offshore corporation, and I'm not going to pay any tax on it until I bring it back. Yeah, well, that's not happening anymore. Um, and they say, but it does. You know, My father used to do it. Well, your father used to do it before 2017, um, and, he, and he didn't do it with passive income in any event. Um, but um, it's, it has been a true sea change. So we then have. Um, three sets of, we have three buckets of income inside a controlled foreign corporation. We have subpart F income, we have guilty income, and then I believe we're going Let's to repatriate. Let's just right? create the next one. So okay. we'll skip the rest of the complicated pieces of guilty. Know that there's lots of wonderfully stimulating, intellectually stimulating rules to get into with the global intangible low tax income. Wait, I, I have to laugh though. Because Scott and Carolyn were saying that you, know, you don't know what tax is because you don't have to do numbers to think that you're doing tax. I teach, LL, I teach international tax in the LLM program at Temple. If my students could hear that statement, they'd say, well, how come this one's making me do all the numbers, this one being me? Um, because two things that, are, that will, um, be, should be very clear at some point in time. Um, there is nothing that you can do under the current regime in terms of advising a client unless you can model out what they're going to look like. What kind of income are they going to have? What kind of, um, what kind of uh, tangible assets are they going to have? Where is it going to be in the organization? That is spreadsheet world. Um, and I don't care if you're a lawyer in a law firm or a lawyer in an accounting firm where an awful lot of this work is done. Somebody's got to do it. Because otherwise, you're, you know, we used to do things on the back of an envelope because if you kept the money offshore, it didn't matter. Well, now even if you keep the money offshore, it matters. Uh, and it's a big difference in how you go about advising clients. Um, I did have an interesting conversation this morning with a client. They're going offshore for the first time. They're buying an operation in Canada. Um, and it's, uh, it's got a, um, a small US component to it. And you know you're in trouble when the client starts out with the conversation with, because we have to structure this organization, uh, starts out with, well, the tax rate in the US is 21%, right? And the tax rate in Canada is 30 something percent, right? OK, let's move, all the let's move all the income, not the operations. Let's move all the income to the US. I said, well, you, know, you kind of have to move the operations if you want to do that. Well, we can't do that. The sales force is in Canada. Well, then I'm really sorry, but you've got to pay taxes in Canada. Um, so it's, but it's interesting to watch clients try and grapple with this. But anyway, I. I I love it. Thank you for sharing that story. More and more interesting with stories. So back to Joan's comment about three buckets of income now that USP is, is um, becomes 
the tax rules USP has to consider. So we have subpart F, generally passive. This active, all you know, tested now under under guilty, and, and the 10% generally 10% return on the tangible depreciable assets. Remember, that's not taxed as 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 income, global intangible or tax income. It's kind of kicked out, and there are other types of income and, and chances for some of the, the income tested under the guilty rules to um, not be subject to guilty. So we're putting that over here as another kind of small slice on that side. That income can be brought home or repatriated under a new section 245 cap A, also introduced in 2017 tax reform. So the way section 245 cap A works is when, so we're, Keeping it simple, so when cash or assets are brought home from, from CFC to USP in a dividend, that, may, that amount may qualify for 100% dividends received deduction, DRD. So you may hear that, hear that acronym as well. Joan, what do you want us to highlight here about Section 245 Cap A? Um, we, we started out the presentation by saying that we were talking about USP. USP is a box. In our world, a box indicates it's a taxed as a corporation. Lots of shapes in international tax. Right. It's one of them. And so if it's a solid box, it's, a, it's taxed as a corporation, a C corporation. It's not an S corporation. And it owns the stock of the underlying foreign corporation, which is a CFC. Um, when you think about these rules, we're talking about the impact on USP, the corporate shareholder. The 245 cap A deduction, the dividend received deduction, is only available to foreign cor to sorry to U.S. corporate shareholders, um, and we could go through the whys and the wherefores of that. Um, but it's a nasty surprise when a U.S. person generally they generally don't own stock in CFCs directly, but they may own stock through a partnership. They may own stock through. Um, an S corporation, um, and suddenly they're told, well, okay, you, Joan, I own my S corporation. My S corporation owns a CFC. My CFC earns $100. It's all guilty income. It's a services business. I have no tangible assets. So that CFC's $100 is all includable in my S corporation's taxable income. Well, who pays tax on that? Me. I'm the shareholder of the S corporation. So I suddenly have an income inclusion. I have no cash to pay the taxes, because who knew about this? Um, and, uh, and then I say, well, wait, I, I understand that you're supposed to be able to take a dividend received deduction. Well, that only applies to C corporate shareholders. And there are logical reasons under our code, because we have this two-tier system. You tax the corporation once, and then you tax shareholders. Um, and that's the system in which it makes sense to do the dividend received deduction. Um, but uh, when the 2017 Tax Act came out, um, the, the, the lack of consistency between the treatment of U.S. corporate shareholders and individual shareholders was truly stunning. And I remember talking to one of the senior counsel in Chief Counsel's Office in International. I said, I don't understand this. Why? Is there such a di dichotomy because between the individual and the corporate shareholder? And she had a very succinct answer. They had no lobbyists. I said, oh, okay. Um, uh, there was one other thing that happened. In, in, I like the political part, as I've said before. Um, Heather mentioned that in 2017, if you were a U.S. corporation that had, uh, that if you were a U.S. shareholder that owned stock in a CFC, you had to bring into income all of your previously deferred income in, in 1986. That applied to C corporate shareholders. It applied to individual shareholders. It applied to individuals who held through partnerships. It did not apply to S corporations. S corporations got a very specific exemption that said that they didn't have to be taxed on their pre-existing income until basically they sold the S corporation. So I, I, I obviously you can tell I have no boundaries. So I called the lobbyist and I said, why only S corporations? Why not LLCs? It's the identical policy argument. 
And the response I got was, I'm only employed by a couple of S corporations. That's all I'm lobbying for. And that's how the bill got passed. Do you know who our large S corporations are in the United States? The Koch brothers own all of their investments through um, S corporations. Fidelity, the money management firm, is an S corporation. There were some huge players at stake in that game. Anyway, I digress again. Bold, okay. Boldly digress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joan. So that wraps up our the, the three main sets of rules we're talking to architect the, the elements of the architecture we're talking about for looking at U, the taxation of USP um, on, on, on income earned indirectly through CFC. Now we're going to move into income earned directly or, or income earned directly and payments made directly by USP on the other side of our diagram. And for me, I'm, I'm doing this because it helped me so much when I was first learning all of these to put them on one page so I have a framework to know where where we are big picture wise. So we'll, we'll keep going with this one page. We can remove items from CFC. Now we're looking at, I didn't click the clicker, a new set of rules called the foreign derived intangible income rules. These come into play when, looking at our foreign customer again, let's say USP is earning income, so this is going to be a money flow, from selling products to foreign customers, providing services, or um, licensing US-owned IP outside the United States. So in that case, USP is earning income directly. That's where the foreign-derived intangible income rules, some people call them FIDI, some FDII, so be aware of that as well. Depends on your age. Come on, <laughs> come into play. <laughs> And what FIDI does is Congress generally implemented it um, as a complement to guilty so that there wouldn't be an incentive to locate IP necessarily outside but outside the U.S. Lots of discussion when inside of tax around, around all that and how the rules actually work. They don't necessarily work perfectly to complement each other, but the idea was there that FIDI would, FDII, would offer a 37.5 um, deduction, which will be reduced, and it's actually increased or, no, sorry, let's be. Um, the deduction is um, offered when a U.S. corporation is selling or providing these services directly into foreign markets. So without going into the, again, these are formulaic rules, so it's not dependent, just like guilty isn't dependent on intangibles. FDII but, isn't, but it's, go ahead, targeting. But, but it's, um, in order to use the, F, in order to use, and I, I'm, I'm of an age where I use the initials, FDII. Um, in order to use that, you have to be able to show that the income is ultimately earned from a non-US customer. Okay, so I've got a US company that has developed um, the next vaccine for the next uh, major problem that we have. They want to license it to um, GlaxoSmithKline in the UK. You might think that that's a license, so, and they're going to get royalty income. You might think that that would comply because you are licensing the IP to a foreign user. Under the regulations, in order to say that you um, have met the requirements that it's going to be utilized in a foreign market, you have to know where the sales are going to occur by GlaxoSmithKline. Right. You think GlaxoSmithKline has any interest in telling you that? No. That's, that is clearly proprietary information that they will not share with you. So what do you do in those cases? Well, some of us have resorted to saying, you know, there are industry norms that we can glean from various publications that say that 37.5% um, of your ultimate sales will be in the European Union. Can I take 37.5% of my royalty income and say that it is foreign derived intangible income and therefore I get to take this deduction? Um, there's not a lot of um, uh, good law on the area. There's a lot of lore in terms of how people deal with it. But this is not as powerful as one would have liked it to have been in order to countervail guilty. 
because at least if I do guilty, that is I take my IP and I develop it outside the United States and I earn all my income in my CFC, I know that my tax rate on that CFC income under guilty is 10.5%. If I leave it in the US and I want to rely on FDII, I have to be able to prove it in order to get the right effective tax rate. Having said that, there are a fair number of companies that, that um, I don't know what the, I don't do a lot of this work because when I tried to do it in my um, uh, pharma space cross-border licenses, I ran into such a, bl a, a hard and fast uh, wall that it wasn't really useful for my clients. Um, that um, there are companies that are utilizing this to keep their IP in the United States, um, but lower their tax rates. But it's, it's the, is it the, the fifth of the five acronyms? So it, there's That's so part of it. B. Yeah, no, a, I'm sorry, fourth, I'm fourth and the fifth, right, yeah, okay. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. number four or five. Moving on to the fifth, so we can wrap, we can wrap up. So we'll have a video introduce us to this in a moment. But here, our final set of rules we're talking about, this is where um, these rules apply to only certain corporations that, like very large corporations, have to meet certain requirements, they become an applicable taxpayer, and then, the, then they have to calculate base erosion anti-abuse tax. And, this is a, and then this incorporates payments that are made from USP um, to foreign related parties. So let's turn to the video. You can get a, a big picture of it. Here's the big picture of BEAT. This is a US corporation that's calculating BEAT. These are foreign entities. When these foreign entities have a special relationship to U.S. corporations, they're called foreign related parties. These could be individuals, corporations, partnerships, and other types, but here they're corporate. And relationship, we won't get into the details other than to say that ownership and control are involved. So in our example, U.S. corporations' foreign related parties are its foreign parent, foreign sibling, and foreign subsidiary. Let's say these five dots represent all the income, assets, and economic activity that could be taxed in the United States. So this is U.S. corporations' U.S. tax base. In our example, each dot represents 10 U.S. dollars of gross income. If U.S. corporation can shrink this amount, the IRS has less to tax. That's called base erosion. One way to shrink or erode the U.S. tax base is with deductions, and BEAT targets this type of base erosion. When U.S. corporation makes deductible payments from the United States to foreign related parties, its U.S. taxable income is reduced. Under BEAT, these types of payments are called base erosion payments. Let's illustrate with a quick example. Here we have U.S. corporation employees in the United States. We'll assume U.S. Corporation is subject to BEAT. U.S. Why is that doing that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so U.S. is making payments to those foreign related parties. You can see that the IRS has a fraction of the amount to tax that it originally did because there's only one dot now. So calculating USP, the US corporation's regular tax liability, you apply the 21% corporate rate, and that tax is 2.1. Do we want to stop and restart this? Would that help? I can keep talking through it. So what BEAT does is it requires, and you can keep going. I'll just talk through it. No. Go ahead, play, play with it if you can. Okay, so what BEAT requires is that the U.S. corporation um, pull in 
some of the base erosion payments, the deductible payments that are required under BEAT to be, the amounts of those must be pulled back into the U.S. tax base. They had eroded the base. And now the BEAT rate applies. Oh, and we're back to the slides. Oh, the video stopped. Okay, great. So the BEAT rate applies, it's an add-on minimum tax. So we had a 2.1% or 2.1 2, 2, 2 .2 tax as a regular tax liability. USB had to bring back, the, bring back in the amounts of the base erosion payments and calculate under special BEAT rules what the minimum tax under BEAT should be for that U.S. corporation. What BEAT says, no, 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 you're not. You should really be paying three in U.S. tax. So the BEAT rate applies. It's a top-up. It's like a top-up minimum tax. So that um, added a 0.9 to the regular tax liability under BEAT. So that's the big picture of the base erosion and anti-abuse tax. And Joan, thanks for your patience and your flexibility with the video. Apparently, we're, we're all exploring here in this, this afternoon session. So Joan, why don't you tell us, um, give us a little insight into why we have BEAT. We have beat because um, the U.S. couldn't win transfer pricing cases. Um, and that, that's, that's as simple as that. Um, we, they lost, I think the, the government lost five big transfer pricing cases in a row. Um, so things like, so a, co a, a company would come into the United States and they would say, okay, um, how are we going to, um, how are we going to set up and fund our U.S. operations? And if you think about it um, in the private equity space, you have a U.S. private equity fund that sets up a non-U.S. company that goes out and buys a U.S. subsidy, uh, buys a U.S. target company, right? So you need to figure out how you're going to funnel the money into the, the U.S. acquisition company to go out and buy the company. Well, you're going to want this private equity world now, right? Cash is king. They need to take money back out to the fund before they sell it. So how are you going to do that? Well, your, your private equity firm fund would form a Luxembourg corporation, which would form a U.S. acquisition company. The Luxembourg company would take money in from the fund. It would lend it down to the U.S. acquisition company. And then the U.S. acquisition company would go out and buy the, um, buy the target company. Well, you have a loan there. The interest that goes back up is free of withholding tax, and the repatriation of the um, the principal is not subject to U.S. tax. So you can strip the money out. At the same time, you've got an interest deduction in the U.S. company that prior to 2017 was shielding all of its income. So it wasn't paying any tax. If you were not a private equity firm, but you were a strategic multinational and you were setting up a U.S. subsidiary, um, there was a very common understanding that you, how did you drain the money out of the United States? You charge the company a management fee. You charge the company a royalty for the IRS that they were, that, uh, uh, the, for the IP that they were using. Um, you lent the money and you charged a deduction, for, you got a deduction for the interest. So those three things, they, you know, it was, it was just what you did. Um, but these U.S. companies were winding up paying next to nothing in income tax. So the first attempt was to go after them through, is it really a loan? Maybe that, that was never a loan. Maybe that was always um, equity, and therefore you don't get the interest deduction. Maybe the royalty rate was too high. Clearly the management fee was too high. But they, they lost five transfer, casing, transfer pricing cases in a row and ultimately said, okay, we give up. Um, we'll just put in the minimum tax. Thanks, Joan. Still have tidbits. That's right. <laughs> so that's our kind of taste of outbound international tax. Those are all, you know, many of can the... Can I just take two minutes? Do we have two minutes that I can use for the pillars? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Spontaneous. So, so where are... Uh, because I... Uh, yeah. Um, so where are we now in outbound international tax? Um, I said to you before that there were two um, impactful years in an international tax lawyer's life. One was 2017. Prior to that was 2013. 2013 is when Europe took the blinders off. Um, Prior to 2013, we were really good at managing the way our large corporations structured themselves in order to get a very low effective tax rate. You could, for example, invest in um, Ireland through what was called the double Irish structure. Ireland thought that the income was being taxed in the U.S. The U.S. Talk, 
thought the income was being taxed in Ireland. In fact, it was being taxed in the Cayman Islands, where there is no income tax. So you got what was called stateless income. Um, and it just was not subject to tax any place. And so the OECD, the organization, the organization for Economic Cooperation and Thank Development. Thank you. <laughs> I've been saying OECD so long, I forgot. Um, started to study this. And in 2015, they came out with a report that said effectively, and actually quite literally, American tax lawyers have been trying too hard for too long to create too complex structures in order to get unachievable um, effective tax rates. And they hated it. They, they, the OECD got really upset with all of this. So they started to study what was going on and how things were working. And at the same time, our economies were changing. And things were going on, um, for example, um, Google had over 300 people um, physically located in London. Uh, the, Google's not my client. This is from reading a newspaper. Um, uh, 300 people in London. They said, oh, what those people are doing, are, their activities are preparatory and ancillary. They're not really carrying on the business. And therefore, under the US-UK tax treaty, you can't tax Google. Um, France, France was really good in this era. France got really pissed when they figured out just how much Amazon was making on the ads that they got from the, that, that were targeted to the French uh, users of the Amazon um, uh, model. Um, and they got really, really angry. Well, the UK went ahead and within six months, when they figured this out, put in a new tax. They called it a diverted profits tax. So if you were doing something like Google was doing, you, you didn't have to use, you just got subject to this other tax. France said, we're going to start imposing a gross tax on um, income from digital services. It's kind of like a tariff. Um, and every, a lot of countries started to put in these digital service taxes. Um, and people started to get very upset about the fact that we could no longer control what was going on globally in tax. So the OECD um, came out, uh, they studied it a lot, and came out with a number of suggestions. And now they have two suggestions, uh, with two things that they are aiming to have us all agree to. The first one is um, an allocation methodology, saying that every jurisdiction in which a company um, derives income, uh, and that's a very loose term, every jurisdiction uh, in which we, they derive income should get a piece of the puzzle and should get, and one of my colleagues describes it as a pizza pie. You figure out how much, what the diameter of the pizza pie is, you figure out how many jurisdictions um, have touched this or contributed to the size of the pizza pie. You take the pizza pie cutter and you divide it into as many slices as you need and you give each one of those countries a slice of the pizza. Completely unmanageable. But it is clearly where, where we're thinking about going. You know, Jay's going to talk to you about state and local tax. I don't think we're very different. Um, and then the other one was no more, no more of this no tax, no more of this stateless income. Every jurisdiction should pay at least um, a minimum, every company should pay at least a minimum tax. Um, and so, so we have two proposals. Pillar one is the pizza pie proposal, the allocation proposal. Pillar two says that you have to be, um, uh, um, have, uh, pay at least a 15% minimum tax. Is he going to stop us? Do we not have six minutes? He's, no, no, I just have a question, John. Oh, sorry. So a question uh, that often comes up when you're talking about, you've talked about the U.S. political um, forces on, uh, earlier in the talk, talk, and now you're talking about the OECD. Does the United States participate at all in the OECD? The, uh, the United States is a very active participant in the OECD. Um, and we are at the table all the time, and we are attempting to influence what's going on. We took a very strong stance against the digital services taxes back in the um, early 2020, um, because we just thought that they were wrong. Um, but the difference in the United States and the rest of the world is that we have to do, the, we would have to implement all this stuff through our internal law um, in order for it to work. We, we're not just going to accept an OECD directive where other jurisdictions may well accept the directive and either change their law or apply a multilateral treaty. Um, we don't have a prayer in hell of getting a multilateral treaty passed. We haven't ba passed a new treaty since 2010 because Rand Paul vetoes every treaty that comes up, effectively. 
So I don't think we can. I don't think we can do anything about the pizza pie. I don't. I just don't think that we'll ever play in that pizza parlor. Um, I do think that the minimum tax that you know we, we already have guilty. We've got beat. We, you know, the, there's some appetite there for us to to work in there. But if you're thinking about international tax and you want to sound reasonable at a cocktail party, you need to know about pillar one, which is the pizza pie, and you need to know about pillar two, which is the minimum tax. I turn it back to you. Thanks, John. So we have a few minutes left to highlight careers in US outbound. And I have five different people, and I asked them I asked each of them, what was the inciting incident that got you into international tax? And in those conversations, they shared some insights. So listen, I feel like a couple themes came out for me anyway, but listen as you're thinking about building your career for a couple themes that I saw throughout, throughout these stories um, that I have to really go quickly. Um, basically, answer the call to adventure and focusing on people and collaboration and look at your own personality, what will work or not work for you, what avenues do you think you may want to explore, what pathways, but really follow, like one of the best pieces of advice someone gave me way back before I even started law school, do what you love. So I feel like that is, is there in these, in these stories, as well as oppor the uh, opportunity and being prepared. So Lauren Pons, and I, uh, each of these people is amazing, super brilliant tax lawyers and some of the highest quality people. Just if you see them at conferences or anything, walk up, introduce yourselves. They're fantastic human beings. So Lauren Pons, she, after LLM, she didn't go the normal route. A lot of LLMs will go right into a law firm or a big four accounting firm. She went moved to Germany and was part of a German-funded global fellowship program, which um, segued into a stint at the OECD. Organization for, Cooper Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris that Jonas is describing, she served there, and then landed at EY for nearly eight years. Then, when Congress began tax reform, there was the um, House Ways and Means Committee was forming their team, and someone not even necessarily close to Lauren um, recommended that she, that she apply, totally unprompted, not a mentor or anyone, and she ended up accepting a position and handling a lot of the international provisions during um, the legislative process of, of tax reform. She stayed another year uh, and then moved on. She's now a member at, at Miller & Chevalier. Great firm. Here's a quote from her. You have to be a little resistant to outside pressure to follow a certain path if it works for you. Some people don't have a very big appetite for risk, but if something doesn't make me a little bit excited and nervous, I don't want to do it. So follow opportunities when your heart says yes. It fits. Alice, oh. I went out of order. Danielle. I met Danielle my 1L year, and I feel like she made my career. I um, met her at a conference after a workshop she had given, and I said, you're amazing. I want to meet you. And she, um, I ended up working with her at Treasury when she was International Tax Council. She started out as an accountant. She was an accounting major, and then in her 1L year, her mom sat next to someone on an airplane who talked about international tax as a cool career, which made sense to Danielle because um, she could get a job inside, uh, uh, out of her 1L, 1L year. So sometimes it's just a practical um, direction for you. And then she summered at Ivan's, a, um, a tax boutique, and became a partner there. And when she was a partner, someone approached her and invited her to um, become the International Tax Council ITC at Treasury. And she wasn't even considering it. And then, and amazing story, but she said yes. And that experience in government was exceptional for Danielle. What she found, what she discovered was her love of working on a team and collaboration. And then that kind of directed her into KPMG's Washington National, National Tax, uh, where she currently talks about the how collaborative the culture is there and like how complicated all these rules are and being able to work collaborati on, collaboratively on a team as well as seeing a large volume from a bunch of different, many different clients and how, um, how they're handling it, she finds super fascinating. And she loves tax policy, but I can't go into it. Okay, so here's Alice. Alice is a, a beautiful member of ABA. She is a professor of law currently. She was an associate for the first six years and 
she got into international tax um, because she had a great professor. She fell in love with tax. And, and then with her language ability, she had immigrated from Cuba at age nine, I believe, so she's Spanish. Her, her folks lived in um, Aruba, so she knew Dutch and, and some French. And she thought she may have more opportunities in international, and so she pursued that at Deckert, and she did. And then Temple approached her to become a professor. And eventually she, she said yes. The story goes no the first time she, was, uh, she had just become pregnant. And she said two big changes in one year, not a fit. And then the next year they offered again. And she said she took it because she wanted to give back. So she says if students want to talk tax, she just loses track of time. So that's the, the people focus as an academic. And I'm out of time, but I really want to cover. Keep going. keep going, keep going. I have two more. Michael Caballero. He is partner and vice chair of Covington, of the tax group at Covington. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor that I had, extraordinary human being, again. So the, one of the first things he said to me, and I think Caroline said something similar earlier on the panel, never say no to something you want to work on, no matter how busy you are. And here's his story. He started out his career in New York. He was doing a lot of international transactional work. And then he... Um, started, uh, as you can see, he, he went to Treasury. And one of, one of the first projects that came up for him, someone asked him to work on a foreign tax credit project at a time when he was super busy. And because the work was interesting and he wanted that, he said yes. And that, he, that like set the direction, he said, for the next 23 years of his career. Foreign tax credit became the backbone of his career. And he became, the next six years at Treasury, he became the, the goat. That's what happened to Treasury. I worked there with Daniel, and I saw this. The, um, when you, like, you can, he became the go-to person for foreign tax credit for those six years. And then, and then coming out, that's his expertise. So he gave me some insight that I thought was very interesting around transactional, like practicing outbound from a transactional perspective or an outbound planning. And so this is one, my understanding of Michael's um, insights. International transactional practice is more, you, this is all general. There's always exceptions. We're in tax. So <laughs> it's always the case. More in New York. Outbound planning, he, he suggests, is more in, the, in DC. If you want to mass, he, like he loves the developing a substantive technical knowledge that that's his skill set. Um, and not that knowledge base, that's on the tax planning, the outbound planning side. Whereas there can be more of a, a skill set based um, practice on the transactional side. And Caroline, in the previous panel, touched on the skill set of, of tax controversy a little bit in that. So you can kind of make that connection there. In transactional work, he was saying that when, in his experience, that the goal is to minimize the visibility of tax. Basically, the geniuses in transactional will work behind the scenes and make tax silent, make the, any tax problems go away. Whereas with planning, he was saying there's tons of collaboration around solving problems for a client. And his, he, the tax planning firms have long-term clients. You're, supporting them to do what they can't do necessarily on their own. So they're, he says they're really glad, and there's no repetition. He said he's had like f five topics repeat themselves in 23 years. Like it's just, he's always looking, looking at something different every day. And Ginsburg was one of his mentors, and he said, when you're picking a firm, it's really important to look at what they have. So what kind of clients does, it, does the client have? What kind of work are they doing? Finally, Sharon Heck. She... I'm lucky to say she's one of, one of my mentors. She's an extraordinary leader and um, is currently serving as chief tax officer and corporate VP of finance at Intel. She's formerly head of tax at Berkshire. She spent time in accounting firms. Um, her introduction to international tax was very interesting. And I talked to her, I, didn't, I hadn't heard of she in her. So am I still good on time? I'm going to go really quickly. So after she had started in accounting for a few years, she moved in-house, and in that experience with a Japanese conglomerate, I believe, um, AFG Industries, they were doing, they were working on an APA, an advanced pricing agreement, one of the first for the company, and so she was brought in, and she fell in love with learning the business, so the combination of tax and business. So she had to understand and dive deep into um, her client, just as in-house, it's one client, as opposed to many clients when you're a consultant, into her client's business facts. And she took that um, and, and built her career 
directed towards really connecting not only the nuance, like mastering the, how do you make decisions about tax that are in the, in the gray areas. So that's one piece, and then she takes it to the next level of actually being the decision maker. That's what she talked about, going in-house, working in industry. You're the one making the decisions. You're at the table um, with the business people. When no one even knows there's a tax issue involved, you can see that. And then, and then you bring in the consultants later in time. So she loves the business decision, the making the decisions piece of, of working in-house. And that. So just getting close, she said, learning how the world runs, understanding how business operates, um, making decisions, and, and why. Like that's that's what she loves, and that's the opportunity that that you can have when you're when you go in house. So with that, we thank you for your attention. Uh, we will be around, and then we hope to see you. Are you going to be able to stop down for a drink? 4:30. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope that we'll see you all downstairs at 4:30. Uh, but uh, you're not leaving yet, I hope, um, because I think you're going to hear a lot of the same themes, um, because I just think. I deal with uh, a lot of countries. Jay deals with 50 states and God knows how many um, localities and everything else. Yeah. So um, it's all the same incoherence. Uh, so thank you all very thank much. All. Joan, Heather, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take about a 10-minute break.